All right. Okay, we're uh, set for 300, and, whoops, dropping it on the floor. 360 degree cameras, a new vantage on weight, water wastewater infrastructure. And we have Mackenzie and Robin from Kennedy Jenks and take it away. Thank you very much, Bud. Um, so I'm Robin Wilmoth and Mackenzie and I will be talking, it's going to be very collaborative between the two of us. So we'll be hopping um, together through this presentation. Okay. So an overview of the presentation, we'll go over 360 degree camera technology um, and some of the applications and also a little bit of the background of why we decided to go down this avenue of using the technology. We'll provide some case studies, some of the scenarios that we identified where its applications worked for um, our uses as a consultant design firm, um, but, but also for our clients. Um, and then we will close with a bit of future applications and some lessons learned. So the first thing is 360 degree cameras. Um, the example you see there is Insta360. It's also what we have right here with me. It's very small um, and it's presently on a monopod with a tripod stand. And so it's very portable. It's one of the great, um, why wh what makes it really usable is you can bring it to a lot of different areas. We did in this adventure of why we're doing this, um, it was about four years ago that we identified that we wanted to start using 360 degree cameras. One of the big drivers of that is previously, these cameras were thousands of dollars. Um, what changed was a different market, in particular, the outdoor market, adventure market, started to use this technology and the price point went really lower. So now this camera is about $200. So that allowed us to try, we said, let's, let's see what, how we can use this technology because it became much more affordable. And we anticipated with some of our field work, because we take a lot of photos when we go to different sites and you might take a picture of something there and then you take a picture of something there. But then when you get back home, you're like, wait, how do they relate to each other? And so with those images, when you start having a more comprehensive images, it helps you spatially to orient yourself. So those were some of the initial impetus of why we decided to use the technology. And we actually decided to use a couple of different cameras. So I first started using a product that was actually a Samsung Gear 360. And um, Mackenzie and a couple of other colleagues started using the Insta360. We wanted to see what different technology was like um, and in the applications. In particular, this camera was also selected because it interfaces with another software called Matterport. And Mackenzie will talk to that uh, in the pre presentation as well. So, um, and we, apply, we have applied these technologies for clients in California, Washington, and any other states? Those are the two I know the most. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit of background of why we started using it. And then the camera, it's, there's the camera, and then it also comes with the st uh, studio software that is used on uh, your computer to be able to visualize it and manipulate. So in the picture that you see, that's an example of this, the video software or the editing software that comes with it. It lets you to um, view static pictures as well as videos because you can take both pictures and take video with the different uh, 360 technology. Some pros, some of the things is, as I mentioned, it's portable. Um, it has the, we bought separately these extension rods, which allows you to go about 15 feet in the air we also started using it to go down into systems. Uh, so realize that it could be really useful for things like going into a wet well or looking into a maintenance hole. Um, so we just started to learn as we were going. Um, the way that it works is you can either use a cell phone or you can use a tablet as your, um, it's your interface of how you view the pictures because you don't view it through this. You view it through um, your phone or your tablet, and then you take the pictures with your phone or tablet. That's actually your remote. So you can have this about 15 feet away from you, and then you're looking at it and you trigger 
taking the photo or taking the video with whatever device, your phone or your tablet. Um, and it does that, this technology does it through Wi-Fi. Um, the other technology I was using used Bluetooth to communicate that remote. Um, one of the other benefits, the user interface, um, and that when somebody says user interface, it's what it looks like, what you're interacting with. So that visual of, and, and also how easy it is to navigate. Um, and so with that, the usability of it, um, and is it intuitive? Do you know how to get from one screen or um, functionality to another thing? And it was actually pretty user-friendly to get it loaded um, and to be able to take the pictures. So being on site with the camera and using your phone or tablet, that user interface was actually really user-friendly. Um, and then the video production, it actually did, has a very smooth um, visual for doing the videos and how you can orient where you need it um, to have, imagine riding a mountain bike down a hill and it actually captures it together. Um, we didn't get to do that, but you could. Um, there are some cons that we uh, wanted to also note and technology has been improving over time, but some of the older generations, uh, battery life was one of the um, challenges. So ways to overcome that. Uh, for example, for this device, Mackenzie uh, purchased a, an extra um, set of batteries that she powered up. So she had three extra batteries that she would power up the night before in addition to the regular one. Um, another way to overcome battery life is to bring power banks with you um, for some of like if your tablets or phones are running out. So having some additional power sources. Um, and then also the technology can get pretty hot. Um, so having ways of it demands, I know even on my phone, my phone got really heated if I was doing a lot of field work. Um, so just having ways of uh, making sure you have a spot in the cooler or a spot in the shade to be able to cool it down and stuff like that. Um, and then the editing software. So using it in the field was really easy. Once I got back from the field, being that we were self-learning how to use the technology. Uh, we didn't have any workshops or tutorials. Uh, we started using YouTube videos and other self-help forums. Um, it was very new, especially three or four years ago. And so we started, there are some pretty hilarious videos, which I appreciate those people that put the time into that. Um, but that was one of the, the learning curves that uh, for sure about uh, having to learn it was the, the editing software. And then one final thing as a con is these lenses are, um, so there's a 180 degree lens here and a 180 degree lens there. They are fragile. So um, I, we both have learned that you don't wanna just lay it on the ground, especially if the ground has gravel. So this one does have a chip on it. Um, so using the stand actually helps it to stay on the ground. It also has a little sleeve. Um, the other one that I had, I would always tuck it away in its little sleeve to protect it. And I would jokingly say I was putting it to sleep, but um, just, it is delicate. There are ways the tri tripod sleeves or cases that can help protect it. All right. Um, and then one more thing about terminology. So again, in the learning, um, I did not originally know the difference between the terms unstitched and stitched, um, but what it is, is in the 360 degree camera world, um, the image on the left looks like two circles and they call that a double fisheye image, um, is literally the view from one side of the camera and the view from the other side of the camera. The way the technology works is it actually takes those two into a dome and imagine you're inside of a snow globe and you can look all around you as a dome and you see inside of there with a 360 degree view, which is really helpful. Um, but the image on the left has to be processed into stitching. And that was something that I learned. So I wanted to share the terminology of stitched versus unstitched. Um, and then they use fancy words like equi rectangular image. I learned that through YouTube and forums. So. I'm gonna pass this over to Mackenzie. Thanks Robin. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the 3D scanning tool a little bit more. Um, 
So like Robin said, we bought the Insta camera specifically um, because of the interface with this Matterport software. Um, so how many of you guys ever been looking for houses and you see on Zillow and there's like a walkthrough? Yeah, see some nods. So this is the software that uses that. So that's been what's really driven this market, um, which is really neat and also one of the benefactors to why the camera prices are going down because there's other markets that want to utilize this. Um, so that was a target of like, hey, what cameras are compatible with Matterport and how can we use them? So there's only a select few cameras that you can process with it. Um, Matterport actually does have its own camera. Um, they have two and one of them's upwards of almost $20,000 and some of them are just a couple thousand. Um, like we said, this one's 200. So you have a huge range, um, a suite of products that you can kind of choose from. It really just depends on the application. Um, like we said, we were kind of in a trial basis and for what we would use it as consultants, which is primarily for communication benefits and condition assessment stuff, you don't need sophisticated um, measurements necessarily, but there's cameras out there that you can do these cool 3D walkthroughs um, that, you know, have LIDAR detectors within them and you can be, you know, down to the millimeter for precision. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later too about some future applications that we have in mind that we could use for this. Um, but essentially, if you've done one of those home walkthroughs, um, you kind of get the picture of, you know, if you're in the frame and you're looking at it on your computer, you can physically click like you're walking through a site. Um, if you, you can also zoom it out and you get kind of this dollhouse view. That's this one in the corner where you're kind of looking at the space as a whole and you can drag it around and flip it upside down and look at kind of everything all in one location. You can look at this at a floor plan view um, and you can take stills and screenshots and all of that. The, the way it kind of works, um, this photo on the far left, um, all those little blue dots are actually all the points where we took a picture. Um, and so, you know, depending on how big your facility is, more or less photos um, is needed. Um, so basically you kind of take this stick, put it on the ground somewhere. I typically go hide because I don't want to be in the frame. Um, take it, it scans, and then you move it another five feet, take another picture. So you can get through scanning a whole facility fairly quick. Um, some drawbacks we've noticed is like it does work like the the camera itself has its own Wi-Fi. So if you're too far away, um, then the iPad doesn't want to interface with the camera. Sometimes you got to get a little closer. So there's some troubleshooting that we experienced while trying to make it work. Um, but it's really cool. And the interface is great with it. Essentially, you start with this black screen and anywhere that you take a shot, it shines a little light when wherever it generates the point cloud. And each time you build upon itself and it just makes this spider web um, until you have your whole facility built. Um, then it you send it back into Matterport, goes into its little cloud space and it processes it for you so that you can get these dollhouse views um, and everything else. So it's pretty neat. It's pretty user friendly. Um, you know, one of the other things and you can kind of see it from um, this picture, oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> um, is the use of tagging equipment. So we were just trying a couple different examples with it. Um, this was down in Centralia. We um, took it into their blower room, and we were just seeing what what can we do with now that we have this space created. How can we how can we use it to benefit? So it lets you drop these tags in. I don't know if you see those little blue squares. Some of them are red. Some of them are green. You can change the colors to be whatever you want. You can change the length of them. It also lets you add descriptions to it. So for example, we were out there, this parasaltic pump, it was shut down because it needed a tube replacement. We were able to jump in, add the tag saying, hey, this is the model of it. This is in standby mode right now. And hey, just, you know, made, I'm sure the maintainer knows how to replace the tubing, but if not, here's the tube replacement video from, you know, Pro Series M's website, and it shows you, you can link it. So there's some cool applications that I think oper like O&M staff could have for this. Um, specifically, you know, because you can update these tags pretty much in real time. So someone can be back at their desk saying like, hey, I did this walkthrough, I need to replace this tubing tomorrow, tag it on there. Maybe the next shift comes in and says, hey, oh, there's three red tags over in this facility. 
can jump in, do the work. So there's just some cool applications um, that we've found in, in terms of uh, how to make this dollhouse kind of thing work. Um, keep clicking this. Um, so here's a couple of case, we're gonna dive into talking about some case studies that we use. Um, so one of the huge benefits that we found um, from a consultant side is communication to the client. Um, so as an example, um, one of the projects I was working on, we were the third party construction manager. So we you know, go between, between the client and the contractor. Um, they were having some disputes about um, roof problems and how to repair it and how to get some equipment in and out and all of that. Um, so what we were able to do is actually I walked through the whole site while we were under construction. I scanned, made a 3D scan of everything, was able to process it through Matterport. And then Matterport actually gets you, lets you have access to be a team site. So more and more clients are using Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Suite in general. Um, you don't want to have someone necessarily have to go download another software in order to access this. So the fact that it can be utilized through Microsoft Teams, which a lot of people are starting to use, was huge for this client and huge for the communication. So we were able to keep the space password encrypted so that just not everybody can have access to the site. Um, and then it lets you just jump in and you can walk around in this 3D thing. Um, so like I said, one of the issues we were having was, you know, there was a, a dispute between, you know, do you need, need to make a repair to cut into this roof? What was existing issues? What was going to be an issue potentially caused by construction that needed to happen? And how can we resolve this? So we were able to do this walkthrough and it's a little tiny, but I don't know if you can see it. There's all those little blue tags. That was all these points along the roof that we had flagged that had potential areas of concern. Um, so we were able to get everybody on a call, um, sit there and talk about it with the client who might not have been on site every day, with the contractor who was on site, and actually document parts of the roof that they were concerned about or weren't, um, and then reach a resolution through it and then have it documented. Because sometimes you all meet out on site, you make a decision, but the roof's not actually getting cut open for another two months. So you kind of figure what those decisions were and then two months go by and be like, hey, weren't you gonna fix that? No, we weren't. All of that communication that just, you know, I'm sure we've all dealt with at some point. So it's a really cool way to just have the exact spot flagged um, and not necessarily need to be like, okay, what day did we take the photo on and where's my notes? And it just made it really seamless um, and cause for, you know, easy resolution for a problem. Um, so that was one example. Um, another thing for an easy communication is um, site access for condition assessment. Um, I do a ton of condition assessment work. Um, like Robin had mentioned, a lot of times you don't see where equipment is in relation to other equipment. This 3D walkthrough is just so cool to be able to just step through it and remember exactly where things are. And remember like, can you actually stand in this space? Um, is this, you know, if we're in a confined space and you're turning around, like, can you actually access that valve? Like, how big does that valve need to be if it needs to be replaced? Um, so it's great for just walking through. It's also really nice when there's just limited access to sites. We spend a ton of money taking a lot of people out into the field. It's really great when you can just have a small field team. They can take scans like this. And then if you have other experts in your company, um, to make other decisions about it um, or take a look and see, is it merited to have, you know, your structural engineer come out on site to actually look at that wall um, or is it okay? Cause he can take a look at a more detailed picture and see the whole thing and be like, no, that's structurally sound or it's not. Um, we had an, another instance where that actually was the case. And we called in our structural and he didn't deem it merited to go out into the site, <laughs> but um, so it's just a great virtual access tool that allows other designers um, input, and it is a great way to walk through with clients. Um, the pictures that you see here, this was, we needed to replace a water line that ran through um, a dam, oh, sorry, that ran through a dam, and it was through a lot of different corridors, um, and there was just specific spots that we needed to highlight, and um, it was just a tool that later, in, you know, once we process the images, pull the client up and show them exactly where we needed to, to hit. Um, it's just a little clearer than, you know, highlighting where sections of a pipe are on a plant and you can actually see it. Um, and sometimes it's 
it's more helpful for you know discussing it too with the O&M staff, um, not needing to dig through potentially outdated plan sets and record drawings that you have. Um, so this was was just a great way to talk to clients. I keep doing that, collecting the computer. Okay. Um, so continuing with some of the benefits, uh, one of the uh, projects that I was working on was we utilize the tools to either help us to avoid and or inform confined space entry. Um, so one of the clients had a series of pump stations um, and conveyance systems, and we were looking at their um, level sensor functionality. So for example, wet wells. Well, it definitely was really, really critical for informing our confined space entry. For some of the wet wells and some of the pump stations, we had, we had good O&M manuals, we had good record drawings for some of them. They hadn't been updated as well. We didn't have as much confidence. And so we were able to, there was a complimentary, have the record drawings with us, but then also have the 360 camera that we were able to put down into wet wells and to start, and also to ask questions because we could see it on, you know, like the tablet or the phone at that time. And we could talk to the operators and the maintenance people. And we'd say, okay, when you pump this down and this survey is going to have to go in there and we could talk about the slope um, of the ground, which spots were gonna be more precarious for walking through, what to look for. Um, the person that was eventually going to have to go in there, we were able to explain to them on site if they were with us or if they weren't able to be with us, we were able to prepare them ahead of time of this is what it's going to look like. This is the pathway. This is where we're going to put the ladder. Um, and so it really helped for the safety of our team and it um, gave everyone confidence that we were doing um, prepared for the confined space entry. Um, and then also there were times that the use of the camera helped us avoid having to do confined space entry. So especially with some of our, the conveyance systems, there were some of the record drawings that were, it was confusing and or outdated. Um, and so they looked at, open several of the different maintenance holes to, because we would ask, like, is this the one that's on here? And they go, I'm not certain. Well, one of the great things is you could send the camera, literally flip it, goes in the hole, look around, confirmed this is what we were looking for. Um, and then in that image on the bottom right, it helped when we were looking down there about the ledge that we anticipated. We had the record drawing there that we had anticipated. We could see what the condition of it was. We could see at that pumping level or at that flow level, was it exposed or wasn't? And it helped us to really plan to make sure that for that access, um, that we had a clear understanding of those existing conditions and did they match the record drawings and plan accordingly. Um, but several of the maintenance holes, uh, we never sent anyone in because we were able to confirm that that route was either not recommended or it wasn't the correct maintenance hole. So anything to be able to avoid having to do a confined space entry is, is great because um, confined space entry is inherently risky. Um, and so we just benefits to safety. And I have to say the, the onsite crew was so excited about this. They asked so many questions. And uh, so there was a, a lot of excitement of using that because they also understand how risky it is. All right, and we're gonna now talk about live feed and confined space. Um, so one of the benefits that we, we kind of just uncovered, we weren't even trying to use it for this application, um, but we were on a client site, we were doing a confined space entry, um, that was known that we needed to do this. So it was, um, again, I, this was the same project we were doing, um, you know, third party CM for, so the contractor needed to get in the space, the drawings called for some pipes to be installed in this kind of cavity section, um, but we didn't know what was in the cavity. So that little circle you see up top on that big picture, they actually core drilled that and they thought this space was just supposed to be open and empty. Um, it wasn't, it was actually totally full of water and they didn't know how it got in there and the plans weren't complete, uh, the old record drawings weren't complete. So once they got the water pumped out in there, we were able to first stick the camera down with just the tripod and kind of like look around, see what was in there. Um, but then this actually was like a serpentine channel underneath new basins. So like the original plant had had this big serpentine chlorine contact basin. Years later, that got replaced and half cut to put another basin on top. So that serpentine channel still existed underneath. 
Um, and it just wasn't really clear what was still there from the different scene of construction that happened. Um, so, but the new draw, the new design called for new pipes to be put in underneath there um, to utilize that space. So what we ended up doing is the con well, one of the contractors um, laborers ended up just taking the camera down because we have real time footage from the iPad. Um, and he just walked the serpentine channel. He had his layer monitor on, he had his radio, normal confined space entry, but he had this camera. So we could have eyes on him the entire time because we didn't know what was down there. Um, and so it was just a great affirmation to kind of just make everyone feel better about this entry in the first place. Um, but also have the camera recording so that then we could show the client later, like, hey, this is what's actually down there. Not that you need to use this space anymore, but heads up. Um, and then also, you know, we took it back to the engineer and they had one of their structural guys look at it because some of the walls looked a little, you know, precarious. There was some spalling, there was some cracking, um, ended up being fine, but it was a great way to like have this live footage, um, for yes, consulting and communication later, but just the key safety thing of, um, you know, the contractor was like really upset that he had to send his guy down in this spot. It was supposed to be a sealed um, cavity space and it wasn't, they didn't know where the water was coming from. There was just a lot of extra red flags that was um, making the contractor uncomfortable. And this really helped mitigate that um, or not necessarily mitigate the concerns, but it was a like, hey, stop here. Let's look around before you go any further. Okay, it's safe to proceed. So it was just a great tool there. Um, yeah. All right. And then so some other benefits we found is just design and construction. Some of them we've kind of touched on, touched on with communication. Um, this is an example of um, kind of some pre-design work we were doing. We we were discussing, the client knew they wanted an upgrade to their boiler system and their HVAC um, and the facility as a whole. Um, so we went into a couple different areas, took some 3D scans. Um, and one of the things that was, was great for later conversations, we were working with a vendor to see, you know, potential upgrades that we could do um, was pull up the 3D scan and walk through, see like, this is how big the, the boiler unit is. There was concerns that it was way oversized for the facility, so we could actually lay eyes on it. You could physically walk around it, or not physically, virtually walk around it um, and see how, you know, what was in there. You could see the ductwork up in the ceiling, see where the louvers were, like all of everything that was interconnected that would have been kind of hard to piece together from just pictures, especially in a really tight room. You know, there's Sometimes in these you know, facilities, it's great. You can stand back and you take a huge shot of the whole area. It's in a tiny room and you have equipment that takes up 80% of that room. You can't really get the pictures you need. Um, so this was a fantastic way to just talk through what are the options that we could propose to the client because this is the space they have and this is the existing equipment that's in there. Um, so that was just a great, great value that we could give to the client. Um, one of the other aspects of I was trialing um, the camera at the time that I was also working on doing um, the final assessments. There had been upgrades, uh, HVAC upgrades for over 20 pump stations for one of our projects. And since I was try had the technology and had been using it, and I had to go to all of these pump stations to document at uh, close of construction, I went ahead and used the camera. I took some you know, two-dimensional normal ones on my phone, but I took the 360 degree photos and it was for our own documentation. But then I asked the client, um, would you like these photos? And they were very grateful to have them because one of the challenges leading up to the project was they didn't have um, some of their documentation for their pump stations was missing uh, some of the kind of miscellaneous projects and upgrades that had been done by themselves or others, et cetera. So it was a, a great like recent documentation of existing conditions that they were able to have and we were able to provide um, and it was a, a nice add-on. And future applications. <laughs> ah, we're just going back and forth. Um, so this is something I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on kind of lightly because I personally have not used it for this. So I just wanna be clear about that. <laughs> Um, something really great we've identified with this software, with the cameras in general, with the 3D scanning um, is, you know, the opportunity that it presents to load it into BIM software, use it in Revit, 
Um, the, the same software that gets the, 3D, the 360 pictures into the 3D scan for the walkthrough can also, it generates a point cloud essentially. And so the more precise of a you know, camera you have, those point clouds can be really, really valuable. Um, and there has been people who, you know, contractors mainly um, that have used it as the foundation for their Revit model. Um, it doesn't just generate the model for you. It just is a point cloud, but it cuts down that modeling time in, you know, in half, I'm assuming <laughs> throwing that number out there, but you don't have to do a lot of the legwork that normally would create to do to create a space when you have all of those reference points, um, especially when you have a very accurate camera. Um, so like I said, I personally have not used this. We have some colleagues in Kennedy Jenks that um, are very familiar with Revit. So we've, we've started conversations with them to try this application and see how far we can take it and um, really see if it's valuable for us as a consultant. Um, but it's just, it's really cool to know that, you know, you can just do one scan, you're already walking through the facility, taking pictures anyways, and, you know, just a little bit more time to take some more detailed photos could just cut down design work um, times in half. And um, it's just great. So, you know, like I said, I don't have too much to say to this, but it's really just exciting that we can use this tech um, and just see how far it goes, the more advanced the cameras get. Um, and just as time goes on, um, what other applications we can, we can make better progress for. All right, so we're gonna share these lessons learned. The first two bullets, um, so viewing the um, 360 degree images does require the post-processing. That's where I was talking about going from, there's the aspect about stitching. So to make it so that it's usable. Um, and then there's another key component about, there's the proprietary software that you get with the camera that you use on your desktop. Um, but there to view the photos, and this is the aspect where you can view it as if you're in that dome that was, you know, like you're in the snow globe. The platforms have been improving over time. Um, and one of them, for example, is uh, that I noticed that like Microsoft is looking to be able to be able to have those images uploaded so that you can view it. I had some images that I took on the previous camera that I used. Um, and three or three years ago, I had to use the proprietary software. And then last year I was able to upload them on to SharePoint and I could actually view it as if I was in the dome. So the platforms are. Um, examples such as Microsoft platforms or social media platforms are working to catch up with and to partner with these technology um, companies on having the software or the images in, in, a, uh, in a type of format that, they, that you can use in more generally accessible platforms uh, such as uh, SharePoint where then the clients could be able to view the images with that full effect um, in, in without having to use as much of the individual um, proprietary technology. And then one, <laughs> the reason why you do not see the other camera and I didn't bring it and we didn't highlight it in here is um, technology can become ob deemed obsolete. Um, so the Gear 360 that I had with, uh, with Samsung got four years ago. Well, I learned about six months ago that it's no longer being supported with software updates and when I transitioned from a Samsung S7 to a Samsung S22, I could no longer use the camera. And so it was one of those aspects we know with different technology upgrades, um, it can happen. For example, cell phones went from the 3G to 4G, 5G. Uh, these things do happen. So when it comes to investing in technology, something that's $200 investment that you get for four years, okay, not bad. If I had spent $10,000 on this and it only lasted four years, I'd be a bit more upset. Um, but just something to keep in mind about how many pieces of new technology you get and the fact that um, the companies may not uh, maintain the software upgrades. So just a little red flag. Um, we're almost out of time here, so I'll, I'll speed through these ones. But um, a couple other points, the picture quality um, for the 360 photos. Um, can be, it's, it's distorted a little bit when it goes through this 3D scanning. So you get these pretty great photos for the 360, move into the scan, and it's a little pixelated depending on the camera you have. Um, that also process, that also happens um, when you take it outside. So we ran into that issue of trying to take 
outside facility footage. Most of our facilities have a lot of outdoor, outdoor spaces. Um, it was not great for that for the 3D walkthrough. But like Robin was saying too, the technology is improving as time goes on, everything's better. Literally was on the website today as I was logging in and they had a big banner that said, now we have outdoor images. <laughs> so it's all about you know software updating, um, what it can handle, different cameras coming online. Um, so, you know, it just, uh, timing when you get it and being patient, I guess, as, you know, technology catches up with what we'd like to use it for. Um, the other downsides that some of, is that, you know, the Matterport 3D scanning, it is a subscription. Um, I know that might be a difficult area for some people. It just limits transfer that we can have to clients or then how long you actually want to keep your space up online. Um, the, uh, it's also, you know, this specific camera is not meant to duplicate construction drawings because it's limited accuracy in terms of measurements. Um, but as all depends, if you get a LiDAR camera, you're gonna be good to go. Um, yeah, so with that, are there any questions? We have a couple minutes left. Did you look at the, oh, it's a little one. Did you look at the GoPro Max or any other cameras besides the two that you mentioned? No, I didn't. So <laughs> um, I guess you could I, talk to- I've used, I've used Go, GoPros. Um, and it was just a matter of, there were only so many that we were willing to trial, um, but I there, there are some forums and online about- I get thank you. There are some uh, forums online about comparing different 360 degree cameras and um, so if you just want the camera to be able to do kind of more where we were talking about just like outside and inspections and you're not looking to do the Matterport, I think it's a little bit more the world is your oyster. Um, if you are looking to try to use this software, the Matterport, where you get that tour, then you would want to look at the compatibility with the Matterport software of which cameras will work with it. Um, so for, I would say, for the company, I did not work with GoPro, but I have recreationally worked with GoPro. <laughs> um, I'd also say to add to that too, if you're looking at getting 360 cameras, look at what software you already have in need. Um, for instance, like the Samsung worked really great with SharePoint to be able to have that film experience. The Insta360, the same photos you download, you don't get that. You just get the flattened image. Um, so you do wanna look at what's your what's your end product um i don't know my screen <laughs> and base it on that for sure and we anticipate that those platforms for viewing it are going to continue to improve and and so it's their goal is they want um especially these bigger platforms they want people to be able to use these images so it's been exciting to see that they started incorporating in um, that functionality even over the couple few years that we've been using it picture of us did you no <laughs> okay thank you we want to see a lot of permission slips <laughs> so so we've been 3d scanning our facilities for four to six years now um we paid in the tens of thousands for our camera so we can do it in-house it's awesome that you guys have the $200 camera. Um, it'd be great if you can talk to your recap guys to see what minimum resolution you guys would want so that we can purchase that camera and do all of our shots and still imports in through recap and stitch together. Um, it's kind of a big gradient from the 200 to the tens of thousands. If you guys can narrow that down for us, we'd love to buy that cheaper camera since we're looking to upgrade here soon. <laughs> Okay. Well, I yeah. mean, we can definitely have the dialogue about what you were using and um, those future applications where we can kind of talk about also where these cameras have gotten in four to six years, um, whether where they are. So we can definitely open that dialogue to support that. Perfect. Is there anyone online that has questions? Have we gotten any of those? Okay. Um, Actually, there is no question. That was me Okay. <laughs> telling them to ask questions. What? Yes, that was actually something. So it does, um, and it doesn't have one. So 
I have found all sorts of ways to jerry rig tiny flashlights to the end of this um, monopod. And that doesn't always work because you don't always have the light in the spot you need it because obviously it's taking a 360 image and the flashlights shoot in one area. Um, so that I don't know if newer cameras have that ability, but that was a, a big downside in sticking into confined spaces that typically don't have lights. Um, so. and, and each of the cameras, so the, um, the Gear 360 that I did have actually did better in low light resolution, um, but, and it could capture quite a bit. We did supplement uh, sometimes with flashlights. A headlamp actually works really well. <laughs> so I wrapped a headlamp around the base of here so I could send it around. So we got pretty creative. Um, we also got some lights that were appropriate for going into maintenance holes, et cetera. Um, to go down with them, especially the super, super dark spaces. So it is something that uh, having complementary light sources that are also um, permissible for going in the, the spaces is, is good to have there. Um, but we did get some, I would say camera to camera, some variability of how well it could do with the low, low light. Thank you, Robin and Mackenzie. It's break time.